I'd like to welcome you all for the first session of our HR Expert Talk series of this year. Thank you so much for joining us. So uh, today we're going to be talking all about the workforce trends to look forward to in 2022 and beyond and um, all that's changing with uh, the HR landscape right now. So today is a special webinar, right? So uh, we have Andrew Spence to host the session for us. So for uh, people who do not know about Andrew Spence, he is a recognized leader and renowned speaker on topics related to how organizations can harness technology and build better um, workplace culture. And also he talks about the future of people management and successful digital transformation. So um, Andy was recognized as one of the top 10 key opinion leaders in the future of work from Onaletica recently. And uh, he's also worked with over 30 plus complex uh, transformation programs with uh, organizations like John Louis Partnership, Novartis, and other government services, including health, prisons, and transport. So Andy, we are uh, glad that you could host this session for us. Wel welcome and thank you once again. So uh, yes, and uh, just a few things to note for our participants. Please note that you are in the listen only mode. If you have any questions, you can always drop them on the questions tab on your left panel. And you can also use the chat bar to uh, engage with your other participants and get to know each other. So uh, we'll also have a question and answer session at the end of the uh, webinar. So uh, uh, it will be answered uh, live by Andrew. So that's uh, pretty much about it. Uh, thank you. And uh, Andrew, oh, over to you. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Princey. And thank you to everyone who's watching this webinar today. Whether you're in Birmingham, Berlin, or Baltimore, you're all welcome. In fact, please use the chat feature to say hello and tell us where you're from. Now, I'm going to get very excited if there's anyone else from a place beginning with B. Anyone from Bombay, Basel, Barcelona? On a personal note, I do hope that you and your family are coping okay in these challenging times. Now, this is the third webinar in a series in the first two, I covered how HR can use technology to improve employee well-being and how HR can use technology to improve workforce inclusion, all in association with Soho people. Now, a little bit about me. Um, I've always had my eye on the future. In fact, I did a master's in cognitive science and artificial intelligence a long time for Miss Alexa and Mr. Watson. And as Princey mentioned, I've worked on a lot of global transformation programs in a variety of work settings, from gothic psychiatric hospitals in London um, to surviving visioning sessions in Los Angeles. And I've been lucky to work in some great teams uh, where a diverse set of people have come together and achieved great things. Um, I've worked with companies like Accenture, McLaren, the NHS, Bombardier, to name a few. But I've also seen some sad workplaces, cold cubicles, and situations where individuals and organizational potential has not been achieved for different reasons. Today, I obsess about workforce strategy. I advise organizations, foundations, startups and scale-ups in different industries and countries. And I share my research and writing for free on my Workforce Futurist newsletter, which you can subscribe to for emails every couple of weeks. Now, before we get started, I always like to um, talk to the audience where I can. So first of all, we have uh, people from Mexico, um, Bom Dia from Sudan, um, Zamona from Basel, how are you doing? And Daphne from Austin, Texas, which is really cool. Now, before we get going, I want to ask you a question. So, which trend will be more impactful on your, on your work life this year? 
Um, and, and what I'm thinking of is more impactful than, say, in previous years. So as I load up this poll, I'd like you to give your, your views. Which of these trends is just going to be a bigger deal this year? It, will it be more focus on teams? Will it be AI projects in HR? Worker well-being? Workforce diversity and inclusion? Or even blockchain projects? I'd be very interested to hear what your thoughts are on that. So please, uh, in the poll that I hope you can see, give your vote. Tell me which of these projects is going to be really important. So currently, um, more people are saying worker well-being has been number one here as, as the big trend. And in a, in a pandemic era, this, uh, this seems rather, uh, rather topical and obvious. But a number of uh, people are working on AI projects and actually, the blockchain workforce is there as well. So we've got a mixture here between workforce well-being and technology. So thank you for, for doing that poll. Now, I want to say something a little bit about predicting the future. Um, I do spend a bit of time thinking about this. And it's quite easy to get distracted by the latest fads and fashions. But, you know, in reality, it's the megatrends that dictate our work. Workforce demographics, climate change, industry restructuring, and new technology infrastructure being developed. So for this audience, who I assume are HR and technology leaders, what will change our work this year and for the next decade? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, this lovely image is a vision of the future from people in the 1930s. Would you believe it? It looks pretty good. You know, maybe uh, apart from the flying cars, uh, they don't have those where I live. Um, and maybe less people are smoking these days. Um, but when we look at what drives our work, we have to look outside of HR um, and outside of the last three years, really, looking at historical, economic and sociological cycles. But a, wor a word of warning about making predictions. We do tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short run and underestimate it for the long run, according to Roy Amara. And our, our predictions tend to be made through foggy Zoom goggles, constrained by the calendar and tossed about by 1,000 randomly swirling factors. Anyway, I'm going to get on to the very first trend. And that is more power to the worker. Now, are we entering a golden age or will workers be taken for a ride? Well, according to surveys of bosses, workers shortages is the biggest threat to their business this year. We've got high levels of vacancies being reported and we're seeing different responses from businesses. I'll give you some examples. Amazon offered new hires $3,000 as a sign on bonus before Christmas. The orders of robots are at a record high. Siemens in Germany offer daycare centers for the kids of workers. And before the pandemic, America's, Americans spent 5% of their working time at home. And by spring 2020, that figure was 60%. So more people working from home. So we're entering a very interesting time for labor versus capital. Now, the context is that the pandemic has destroyed millions of jobs. You know, it's caused a drop in employment that was 14 times bigger than after the financial crisis uh, 11 or 12 years ago. And with many key workers having to work in close proximity with people, many sadly died. Also, to take a global view, there's about 3.4 billion people employed in the world, and about 2 billion are, are, are informally employed. And over half the world's working age women are not in the formal labor force. So there's, there's a real opportunity here for economic inclusion. Now, there's talk of the great resignation. Everyone's talking about it in our, in our media. But here's some perspective. If we lift it up three years, what I see is just pent up attrition. People couldn't leave their jobs in lockdown and, and furlough. If we lift it up 10 years, what I see is a growing trend for people wanting to work independently. They're looking for autonomy, 
for flexibility and equity. If we lift it up 30 years, what we see is 600 million Chinese workers joining the global workforce, which has had the effect of suppressing wages in the West, which I believe has peaked now. So wages are increasing, prices are rising, and profit margins are being squeezed. What does this mean for you? So one caveat I will say for every trend is it does depend whether you run a supermarket, a graphic design studio, an army platoon, or a hospital. It depends where you're located and the labor market and whether you employ professors or street cleaners. But what you can do is make your organization uh, an attractive place to work, obviously. Expect more churn, attract and keep the best people, and think more broadly about sourcing work. Uh, it's more than just filling vacancies. It can include um, more around uh, using suppliers creatively, talent platforms, and investing in automation. Now, the second trend is what I call the decentralized workforce. The job is unbundling slowly into tasks which have been allocated on platforms. In the USA, up to one in seven working age adults have worked via a platform at some point. And the so-called gig economy, it's not new or very well defined and includes artists and on-call workers, contractors, seasonal workers, and even a few HR consultants. Now, during the pandemic, many people have dabbled in what is known as their side hustle. Not everybody wants to work for a boss dictating our hours, our rituals, and our pay. And the technology and platforms have enabled this. For example, we've got playborers and live streamers, people earning money, believe it or not, from their prowess with games. Did you know the global gaming industry is bigger than the movie industry? Then we've got solopreneurs or digital shopkeepers using eBay, Etsy, etc. Shopify has a million stores selling anything from homemade masks to jewelry. And platform workers, they're not just drivers, but chefs, carers, teachers, dog walkers, experts matching supply and demand for a transaction fee. So what does this mean for you? Well, I think, you know, it's a balance here, but you can support employees side hustle. It might even be to your benefit longer term. If they leave, they might come back again. And, you know, you can't stop them anyway. And again, think broadly about sourcing work. Maybe some of these platforms are a good way of sourcing teams for your work that you do. Now, the, the, the third trend, um, and it's nice to get some fluffy toys into my presentation, is there's been a massive investment in work tech, as it's now known. It's been known as HR technology, work technology. $8 billion was invested in this segment in one half of last year. Um, so I define work tech very broadly as the technology we might use to, to get work done. So includes recruitment, productivity, hiring, and learning. Now, we're all reliant on tech to work, from virtual meetings to webinars on HR trends and asynchronous work tools. Now, recently, there have been funding rounds that have propelled several HR tech firms to the status of unicorns, which uh, is a company worth a billion dollars, a private company. Um, we had Salesforce buying Slack last year uh, or the year before for $28 billion. And the reason for that is this huge global demand for upskilling and learning inside and outside of organizations. I've mentioned 3.4 billion workers, but many work in smaller organizations um, who traditionally have not been serviced by HR SaaS tools until relatively recently. But now anyone can use uh, tools such as Zoho People. And it's a massive opportunity to improve the employee experience. Did you know that the average user uh, in an organization has to open 30 different apps or platforms in a given work week, which doesn't give a good employee experience? But for balance, I would also say I would give some health warnings if I'm an industry analyst here investing in work tech. Uh, our data is poor sometimes. Uh, as you know, if you put poor data in, you get poor data out. 
the billions invested in AI technology relies on good quality data, which is a challenge. And, you know, the workforce is changing so quickly. It's taking time for organizations and tech vendors to respond. And it's been documented by sociologists that we're in a loneliness epidemic. Work provides more than just money and, and paychecks for many people. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, but Web3 and blockchain technology will change everything eventually. And more on that in a minute. So technology, you know, it's kept the ship afloat during this pandemic from comms tools uh, like those provided by Zoho, which have provided a lifeline to housebound workers to home delivery apps bringing hot food to the front door. So we can try all of those out, and I'm sure we have them. Trend four, with all this technology, we're getting better workforce insights. We've got more data than we've ever had in HR, and we've always had a lot anyway. And of course, if we're, if we're, if we're looking at solving complex organizational problems, we need access to good quality data. But in our HR teams, we need the right skills and experience to interpret the data. We need to be aware of our biases. I'm, I'm sure I have them, and I'm sure you do too, even though we, we might not admit it. And the ability to ask the right questions is key. We need to avoid some of the noise on social media and focus on the questions we need to solve. And what are the organizational questions that you're grappling with? Um, some that I hear about, uh, how do we increase team productivity in, in the southern region of our shops, for example? How do we attract more women into our tech teams? Where should our workforce be located? How do we reduce attrition in our sales team? Which workforce systems should we use? And I'm sure there's loads of others. In the chat, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be cool if you could share which organizational questions you're grappling with at the moment. Now, in recent years, we have seen the success of people analytics teams and technology in our organizations to answer these types of questions. The key for me is to have big questions, not necessarily big data, but a warning. In the digital COVID age, with millions of employees working from home, there are reports of employers using surveillance to recreate the oversight that we'd have in the office, in workers' homes. So there's talk of uh, incidences of tracking login times and even taking screenshots. So we have to use technology to empower workers, but not to spy on them. And it's important for people's sense of autonomy and dignity and mental health that home remains a private space and they're trusted to do their work. And talking of teams, all great work happens in teams. We know that. Think of the achievements from your favorite sports team. Well, unless you like me and support Manchester United, but imagine your favorite sports teams might be in cricket, hockey, baseball, football, or even the Tiddlywinks team. Or it could be the vaccine development team or healthcare team. There are great accomplishments at work, despite the fact that many of our management and HR processes are all designed around the individual. The days of trying to design organizations by switching boxes on PowerPoint diagrams and keeping track of budgets on an Excel spreadsheet should be long since gone, but it still goes on. Now, as work is gradually moving away, from rigid hierarchies to teams of collaborative networks, we need to look at our tools again to understand team dynamics. Leaders need new tactics to motivate, coordinate, and align networks of, of teams, sharing information and enabling them to work collabor collaboratively. Command and control top-down approaches will not work in many situations. And the way teams are formed and operate it's not always predictable. They may, go, they may not go through just a linear phase of storming, norming, and performing. And research shows that successful teams use tactical training interventions, 
They adopt coaching at a team level. They have clarity around purpose, goals, and behavior. And they regularly take time to reflect together and hold one-to-one -one meetings. Now, another set of data we can look at when solving business challenges is from employees' actual behavior using organizational network analysis, which is a promising new technology. And now this measures patterns of collaboration by analyzing the actual interactions between people in networks, moving away from the static views of organizations. So it, it, it looks at uh, patterns in, in, in terms of networks, such as uh, central nodes, knowledge brokers, and those on peripheries of networks. Now, ONA has been useful in onboarding um, by identifying informal leaders who can be buddies to new hires, which is useful, and that accelerates their time to productivity and enhances their overall employee experience. Another example is in change management, where informal leaders can be um, identified and used as early adopters in strategic changes. And also, which is very relevant, is helping um, companies assess employee burnout risk by monitoring the, their digital footprint with their permission, such as the percentage of comms outside of working hours, the percentage of unread messages, or the average response times. So this is a promising technology. Now, talking of uh, burnout risk, um, mo a lot of you mentioned worker well-being as one of the key focuses for your, your work this year, a key trend. Um, and I, in the second webinar in this series, I did cover how HR can use technology to improve employee well-being. Um, I don't know whether um, we could share the link to that, <coughs> Princey, in the, uh, in the chat uh, for people to watch another time. So the pandemic has not only damaged our physical health, but also our mental health too. Researchers found that 73% of respondents feel more burnt out since the onset of the pandemic. We all know somebody who has suffered from the pernicious effects of occupational burnout. Well, I have, maybe you have, or someone you know. Burnout is defined as chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. And it's characterized by three dimensions, feelings of energy depletion, increased mental distance from one's job or negative feelings or cynicism related to one's job or a sense of ineffectiveness and a lack of accomplishment. And the well-being of an individual, it's not an employer's responsibility per se, but on the other hand, employers have a duty of care to their workers to provide safe working environments. Now this includes preventing accidents, obviously, uh, which is a big focus in industries such as construction, mining, and energy. But it also means employers need to provide work that is free from harassment, discrimination, and toxic work cultures, which cause low morale and even mental health issues. So here's some suggestions on preventing burnout. It'd be good to hear yours too. So just as uh, positive well-being requires a holistic approach to health, we also need to look at the big picture for our organizational health. Good work design is fundamental for both well-being and productivity. So I think we need to listen to workers. Um, measuring employee sentiment and feedback are not only uh, important for hiring, retention, engagement, they're an essential business process. And remember, not all of your workers are formal employees. Many um, will be freelancers, contractors, temporary workers too. So evaluate what works in your organization. Uh, it's easy to get generic advice, but how that works in your mining company or pharmaceuticals company uh, will be very different. Um, so I'd say be skeptical of marketing claims and do your own research. Critically assess the best available evidence for the kind of problem you've got and ask better questions. Try new technology. It's not the whole answer, but it can help if it's used correctly to improve workforce inclusion, fairness, and productivity. Maintain a well-tuned workforce measurement engine. Capture the right workforce data across the employee life cycle. And as mentioned, uh, empower workers uh, to be healthier and more productive, but don't spy on them. Just because we can measure it, doesn't mean we should. And for individuals working from home, 
this has been a challenge. Um, and this is really a personal experience. You know, we lose some, some of the buffers in the office that are actually quite useful. Um, you know, they, they stop us working at night, make us socialize with colleagues now and again, even when we're not in the mood. Now, personally, I found it useful to introduce some buffers between work and home. For example, on a day off, I switch off my work apps, you know, the work email, the LinkedIn, et cetera. And, and I try and have a week off every three months. And even if I don't go anywhere special, I make sure I switch everything off for a week. And that's for my own, maintaining my own mental and physical health. But what works for you will be personal. It's not worth, um, it's worth trying these different things out for yourself. And another trend is around casting the net more widely. In the first webinar in this series, I covered how we can use technology to improve diversity and inclusion. Now, it's been estimated by the World Health Organization that over 100,000 health workers have died from COVID. And some occupations have had more exposure to the risk of disease than others. And of course, there's a diversity and inclusion angle to all of this. In certain frontline roles in the pandemic, Women do 75% of the jobs. So three things I would say around uh, the diversity. The pandemic example is an illustration of why workforce inclusion should not just be an afterthought for organizations, but should be core to every important business decision made. The approach to monitoring and improving workforce inclusion is related to other organizational goals too. And it, workforce inclusion is an area where HR can demonstrate real leadership um, as people scientists and workforce technologists. And building on the talent and workforce inclusion angle, from Sritar Vembu, uh, Soho CEO and co-founder, and Princey's boss, there's enough latent talent in the world that's waiting for an opportunity. At Soho, we believe in providing that opportunity. So it's not just for fairness, but for business results too. And cognitive diversity will be a differentiator in competitive industries, getting the best brains and talents uh, together working well in a team. So every business problem has an inclusion aspect to it. And if you look at the image on the right-hand side, I took some photos of several emerging HR tech vendors when I was at my last conference in Las Vegas a couple of years ago. Well, those were the days when you could travel to conferences. I miss them actually. All the tech vendors use chatbots in this photo, but can you spot a trend? Well, yes, you've noticed. Jane, Evie, Olivia, Maya, and Ali all appear to be female. Now the World Economic Forum found that 80% of data science and AI professionals were male. So when nearly 80% of a, team, of, of a team are men, what could possibly go wrong? Anyway, more on this with some AI examples coming up. Now, I was glad a couple of you at least mentioned that blockchain was something that you are working on in your organization. Well, you've all heard of Bitcoin, right? Let me know on the chat if you own some Bitcoin, even a small amount, that'd be interesting. Well, it's been said that Bitcoin is everything you don't know about money combined with everything you don't know about computing. And blockchain is the underlying technology behind Bitcoin. Now, blockchain is a decentralized database shared amongst a network of computers, all of which must approve an exchange before it can be recorded. Basically, it's a ledger of blocks. And we can use blockchain to exchange digital assets without friction, execute smart contracts and store digital records, and it's all encrypted and decentralized. So the real value of blockchain, in my view, is that with peer-to-peer -peer technology, it can help cut out the intermediaries. And where are the intermediaries in HR? Well, in the UK, where I live, there are 24,000 recruiting agencies. 
Now, where is blockchain being used in HR and organizations? I'll give you a few examples. Um, in Singapore, all new students graduating from, from its universities are issued with digital wallets using blockchain to demonstrate the validity of their degree. Workday, um, who you will have heard of, announced Workday credentials, allowing candidates to apply for jobs using verifiable credentials. And the nonprofit Velocity Foundation has formed with a lot of um, large uh, industry players from, from HR tech and staffing. And they're, that, they're building the internet of careers. So that will allow members to swap candidate data between employers seamlessly. A worker has their career credentials checked once. Done. Green tick. No need to check again. This is a powerful idea. And um, it's going to get traction in the next two or three years. It's going to save time, increase trust, and is much more efficient than the current system. And there'll be a massive impact on the use of intermediaries in certain industry verticals. And this isn't just some startup. Workday and Velocity alone represent nearly a billion workers. Also, um, Brain Trust is a platform that halves the transaction fee for freelancers who actually um, own and, and run the, um, the platform using tokens. And we also have the Centralized Autonomous Organizations, or DAOs, you might have heard of, where teams are getting together and creating new organizations with digital contracts, sharing equity, etc. In my Workforce Futurist newsletter, I've given examples uh, recently of artists, publishing platforms, and others who are using DAOs, and also uh, gaming as well, uh, such as Decentraland. All these changes are coming your way. So I would say to find out more if you're interested, um, participate in industry pilot schemes. I'm sure there will be some in your industry. Learn about blockchain. Um, cut through some of the myths uh, around Bitcoin. Don't bother learning the maths um, and just start to get a feel for it. Start to accumulate tokens. For example, for internet browsing, you could use the Brave browser. So you choose the level of adverts you see every month. With our current browsers, they're all free. However, our data is sold to advertisers. With the Brave browser, you know, you can receive tokens for clicking on ads. Turns the whole um, uh, model on its head. And it's an interesting way to think about providing services in Web3 in the next decade. And think about what digital career wallets might mean for your company in terms of opportunities and threats. There's going to be less checking and fees for a start. So I mentioned AI. Now, the way to look at AI um, isn't some cute robot um, who can speak to you. Actually, it's a bit more mundane than that. It's a continuation of the general automation trend, more about algorithms and advanced statistics. And in general, AI includes natural language processing, pattern recognition, and machine learning. We probably all use AI today with one of our apps, Netflix, Uber, Spotify, Zoho itself. Um, but what about in HR? Well, I think the potential. AI comes into its own with pattern recognition that can be missed by us humans with all our preconceived ideas and biases. The holy grail in hiring is finding that perfect team member. You know, we've got thousands of different data points from skills, demographics, personality, uh, interview performance, which football team you support. Um, and we need to use those data points to predict which are the important ones for subsequent work performance. Let me give you an example of where AI is used is the, in the humble job description. I mentioned um, our apps having female characteristics for no obvious reason. It might just be because 80% of the development team are hairy fellows like me. So let's flip this gender gap problem around. How can we use AI to hire more women into these teams? One suggestion is anonymizing job descriptions and using tools to make the tone and language more inclusive. So 
tweaking job descriptions. It's not going to shift centuries of conditioning. But achieving more balanced and cognitively diverse teams might improve design decisions. Anyone in HR and recruitment will know JDs are often subject to lots of cutting and pasting. Now, employers are using AI tech to statistically analyze response patterns to different words in the job description. With looking at gender responses, for example, the phrase work hard, play hard, or coding ninja attracted more men to adverts. And words such as adaptable and creative attracted more women. Now, the experienced HR people will not be surprised by this. But you might think of other scenarios where you can use this technology. However, we need to use the right tools for the job. I'll give you another example too. Amazon tried to build a machine to hire the best technologists. They wanted to be able to take their 10,000 applications or 100,000 and, and, and find the five best candidates based on the past criteria of success. Now, the only problem with that is that the typical software engineer looks like me, a fella. So the pattern recognition software was actually screening out words with women in them, like women's chess club. Now, to be fair, this was done years ago, it was recognized and it was fixed. So AI is extremely useful, but as with any tool, we need to use it in the right way. Now, the final trend is a very interesting one, I think. As I mentioned, we're seeing jobs uh, unbundle and rebundle into interesting forms. And a lot of those tasks are being redistributed on online platforms. So we're seeing new ways of organizing work. And in some ways, sometimes they're like older ways of organizing work reinvented for the digital age. We're seeing digital guilds, platform cooperatives. I mentioned DAOs and teams forming in the metaverse to solve problems and create value. If you ever wa watch a bunch of kids gaming, it's all interactive, solving complex tasks. That's the workforce of the future. The image that you can see is from motorbike riders who use platforms for paid deliveries in Jakarta. And they've grouped together to create driver collectives called Ojo. Now these communities offer different services, such as mobile phone charging, tech support, emergency response services, and informal insurance-like systems in case of injury. And the groups use WhatsApp and Signal to communicate. Now, what's interesting is the platform owners recognize and have formal communications with these OJO groups. And it's a, it's a nice example of how platform workers are using their collective strength to improve their conditions, which has some parallels with the early days of industrialization when the unions were established. And we're also seeing uh, examples of platform cooperatives. For example, the Drivers Co-op is a rideshare based in New York, owned by the drivers. The Co-op Cycle is based in France, which is a federation of bike messenger co-ops, um, and it provides the tech behind that. Stocksy is an artist-owned uh, stock media agency committed to providing an equitable platform for photos and things. So that was a rather quick skip through 10 impactful workforce trends this year. And I think they're also going to play a big part in the next 10 years. They're all interrelated. They're going to impact some of you more than others. Depends on your organization, what you do, where you are, and your workforce. From more power to the worker, uh, with challenges filling vacancies, to the need to think more broadly about work, how millions are leaving employment and doing their own thing, all enabled by tech, and how we need to be more focused on teams in our organizations. And for our workforce, we have better insights, which can help improve diversity, productivity, and well-being. And I've also touched on emerging technology that we will start to use more of in the next decade for sure. 
Now, I'll talk a little bit about how this all impacts people management and HR in the next 10 years. Um, I think, uh, this is a personal view, the work to find and contract with new workers for teams will be more automated using insights from a broad set of data. This will enable more frequent and frictionless matching between people and skills and work to be done. So I think we can have smaller organizations with much smaller central support functions. We can have decentralized teams enabled by better data and tools. In this scenario, the role of a people function will include enabling diverse self-sufficient teams and ensuring that they're compliant and that the company's strategy is being delivered. So instead of using management processes that we inherited from the last century, leadership will involve nurturing talent networks. Now, this is going to be great for people who understand how to get teams working well, who understand how people behave in organizations and can see the big picture. And I think it's crucial that HR professionals shape this conversation as this new infrastructure of work is being built now. We don't want to be stuck with the old, uh, the old ways for another 10 years. Now, I want to close with another question for you. I've mentioned 10 trends. Now, I think they're, they're going to be impactful this year, and they have been for a while. But which of the 10 trends I mentioned is going to be most impactful to your work in the next 10 years? So I would like you in, to give your gut reaction with one vote on the poll you can see on your screens. Which trend will be most impactful to your work in the next 10 years? Will it be more power to the worker, the decentralized workforce, people creating their own businesses, massive work tech investment, better workforce insights, more focus on teams, worker well-being, diversity and inclusion with casting the net more widely, or will it be blockchain, the blockchain workforce, AI and HR, all these new types of organizations forming? So of the 10, what's your vote? I'd be very interested to hear what's going to keep you busy in HR and tech and in leadership roles uh, in the next 10 years. So let me talk about the results as they come in. It's not quite as exciting as the Eurovision Song Contest, but here are some of the votes. It's, quite, it's actually quite level between more power to the worker, the decentralized workforce, so workforce changes, massive work tech investment is there with those, and teams and well-being. Actually, it's a, it's a tie, although more people are saying the decentralized workforce. Now, that's really interesting because I think um, it's, it's not seen at all by uh, my colleagues in HR. Um, they're not thinking about these platforms and opportunities for working with different types of contractors, basically. Um, that, that's very interesting that that's come out as the number one trend for the next 10 years, the decentralized workforce. Well, I, my, my, my essay on this, 3,000 word essays on workforce futurist, you might find it interesting. There's lots of examples of all those different types of workers. Um, from, from experts who are being paid by the hour in crypto tokens. Uh, I mentioned the gamers, the YouTubers. You know, some of those in the top 10 are earning millions every month, and some of them are kids. Um, the people with the, with the shops I mentioned, um, the people who are, who are actually getting small income streams from exchanging their, their time and attention is interesting too. So that was very interesting. Thank you for completing the poll there. So um, I would say to you, to sum up, good luck in this year and in the coming years. I do hope that you and your family and your organization stay healthy. Do keep in touch with me. On, I'm on Twitter at Andy Spence or subscribing to Workforce Futurist. And I would like to say personally, thank you very much, Princey, 
and Zoho people for putting these uh, these webinars on. Yeah, so thank you everyone for joining us today. And Andrew, uh, thanks a lot for hosting this session for us. So thank you and uh, have a wonderful day ahead.